Our next speaker is a professor of law and history at Capital University in Columbus, Ohio. His teaching is mostly focused on constitutional history, but it also includes courses on copyright and libertarianism and the law. His books, likewise, focus on constitutional history, including The Constitutional Thought of Thomas Jefferson and Liberty of Contract, Rediscovering a Lost Constitutional Right. And his current book project has a very interesting title, Freedom's Constitution, a Contextual Interpretation of the Constitution of the United States. Please welcome David N. Mayer. Thank you. Thank you. In 1787, 88, while the Constitution was being ratified and debated here in the United States, Thomas Jefferson was in France serving as uh, the United States Minister to France. Um, he received a copy of the Constitution from his good friend James Madison, who of course was at the Constitutional Convention and because of his efforts and not only at the convention but in getting it ratified, particularly in their home state of Virginia, uh, is credited with being uh, uh, the father of the Constitution. Uh, Jefferson generally approved of the new federal Constitution, but he wrote to Madison and to other correspondents in America that he had two main concerns, two things that he viewed as fundamental flaws in the Constitution as originally written. One of them, the absence of a Bill of Rights, uh, was one in which so many Americans shared Jefferson's concern that uh, the addition of the Bill of Rights became a political necessity in order to fully get it, getting the Constitution ratified. His other concern, however, was one that Jefferson seemed to hold all by himself. And that was, in his words, uh, the perpetual re-eligibility of the president. In other words, the absence of what was then called rotation in office, uh, which doesn't mean a swivel type office chair, uh, but is a re reference to what today we would call term limits. And Jefferson was concerned that there were no limits on the presidential term. Um, given the significant powers given to the President of the United States under the Constitution, which I'll be focusing on uh, particularly in this part of the talk, um, Jefferson feared that uh, a president might get continually reelected, and that the office would become, uh, in effect, an elective monarchy, which is an evil in itself and but one step away from a hereditary monarchy. Uh, had we fought the Revolutionary War, thrown off uh, Americans' uh, uh, loyalty to the British King George III, in order to substitute an American king uh, as the new president. That was the fear that Jefferson, and particularly many of the anti-federalist uh, critics of the Constitution, uh, had. Um, however, as I mentioned, not many Americans shared Jefferson's concern about the re-election of the president. Um, in his own words, uh, that uh, uh, fear was put to rest by the unlimited confidence that the American people had in George Washington, whom everybody expected to be elected the first president under the Constitution, as indeed he was. Um, Jefferson, however, continued to warn that amendment of the Constitution would be necessary uh, because, he said, and this is the context of that famous statement uh, that he made, that the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. About this problem particularly, uh, he said amendment of the Constitution to correct this flaw, to put term limits on the presidency, would have to wait until, in his words, inferior characters 
succeeded Washington in the office and awakened us to the danger which Washington's merit has led us into. I always like to stress that phrase, inferior characters, because I quickly note that it wasn't until after Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, in 1945, after being reelected to an unprecedented third and then fourth term, suddenly died, thereby effectively becoming the president re-elected for life that Jefferson feared that the 22nd Amendment was finally added to the Constitution in 1951, limiting the president to two terms. Nevertheless, have Jefferson's other fears about the U.S. presidency uh, become uh, uh, true? Has the presidency effectively become an absolute monarch in the modern era as the president's powers have expanded far beyond the scope envisioned by the Constitution's framers? Well, that's the general question that I'm going to be addressing in this two-part talk. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the early history of the presidency, what the framers of the Constitution designed the office to be, how the early presidents, through actually most of the 19th century, actually exercised the power of the president. And then tomorrow, in part two of the talk, we'll turn to the modern era, starting in the early 20th century, up to the present day, and talk about the ways in which modern presidents uh, perhaps have indeed realized uh, Jefferson's greatest fears about the president becoming uh, like a monarch, uh, what many people today call the imperial presidency uh, model. Um, before we talk about the founders' chief executive, how the framers of the Constitution designed the office of the president, um, I want to uh, read yet another Jefferson quote, one that I think that I have found particularly useful in thinking about not just executive power, but the Constitution as a whole, the powers of the national government in all of its branches. This is a quotation from Jefferson's famous Kentucky Resolutions, uh, drafted in 1798. Uh, in arguing that the controversial Alien and Sedition Acts that were enacted during John Adams' presidency were unconstitutional. And in the eighth of the Kentucky Resolutions, this is what Jefferson wrote. Free government is founded on jealousy, not in confidence. It is jealousy, not confidence, that prescribes limited constitutions to bind down those whom we are obliged to trust with power. After further noting that the Constitution had fixed the limits of power, Jefferson concluded, in questions of power, then, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. I love that metaphor. It is such an apt metaphor because the purpose of having a written constitution is to limit power, to protect against its abuse. Hence, a respect for the chief structural devices found in the document, the chains of the constitution, to safeguard both the rights of individuals and to protect against the abuse of powers is an absolute necessity in interpreting the Constitution, a lesson that many people, including a majority of the justices on the Supreme Court today, have yet to learn. Um, because of that purpose of the Constitution, to limit power, um, it's important to take seriously these structural safeguards. And uh, in the federal Constitution, there are chief, there's chiefly two principle of federalism, which is ensured by setting up a national government of enumerated powers in all of its branches, not just the powers of Congress, the legislative powers, but the powers of the chief executive, the president, the powers of the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary are enumerated in the Constitution. The national government has only those powers granted it under the Constitution. All others are reserved to the states or the people as the Tenth Amendment affirms. So that is the fundamental limitation of powers. But there's an additional one just as fundamental that deals with the way powers are allocated among the three branches of government as we refer to them. And that's the principle of separation of powers. The idea that to really protect 
against the abuse of power. It is important to take the three basic functions of government, the power to make law, to create law, the legislative power, the power to enforce or execute the law, the executive power, and the power to interpret the law, to identify the law, and to apply it in actual cases and controversies, the judicial power, and put those three different powers functionally in three separate hands. Uh, that was an important check viewed by the framers and viewed today by most constitutional scholars has a very important fundamental check uh, on the abuse of powers. Uh, the very way that the U.S. Constitution is written and organized with Article I dealing with legislative powers, Congress, Article II dealing with executive powers and the President, Article III dealing with judicial powers and the Supreme Court and other federal courts reinforces that separation of powers is the chief structural feature of the U.S. Constitution. But the framers of the Constitution didn't stop there. I sound like one of those late night commercials. You know, not only does this knife pair an apple, but you can also use it to these things. We don't just stop there. Because in addition to separation of powers, the framers of the Constitution put in an important ancillary, a corollary principle called checks and balances. Now, people confuse the two today. We, we talk about them almost as if they're interchangeable. But checks and balances, technically, are exceptions to separation of powers. Uh, an example of check and balance is where one branch of government shares in a power which under a pure theory of separation of powers would be exclusively assigned to another branch. Why were certain powers shared uh, between more than one branch? Uh, again, it was to check against an additional check against the abuse of powers. And we'll be talking, I'll be talking shortly, about two very important examples of checks and balances that apply to the president. The most famous one, and the most obvious one that I hope most of you are thinking of right now is the presidential veto, which gives the president a share in the legislative power with Congress. Um, an example of check and balance from the other side, maybe not so obvious, uh, is the role of the Senate in confirming appointments and in ratifying treaties because of, uh, appointments and treaty making powers generally are viewed as executive uh, in nature. So enumeration of powers, federalism, separation of powers, checks and balances, those were the structural devices to safeguard rights, protect against the abuse of power, the chains of the Constitution that Jefferson was referring to uh, in that passage from the Kentucky Resolutions. One additional point to make, a uh, fundamental point, about the Constitution as a whole, and it applies particularly, as we'll see, to questions of executive power and the presidency, and that is the need to interpret the Constitution in a contextual way. Uh, the book that I'm currently working on uh, takes this very different approach to constitutional interpretation, uh, appreciating the importance of context. Uh, that, of course, was a very important principle, important principle in objectivism. Uh, it's a principle which Ayn Rand used specifically in criticizing the Supreme Court in her essay in 1973, Censorship Local and Express, where she was criticizing the obscenity decisions of the court. Um, she did so in language that could almost be perfectly applied to Chief Justice Roberts' decision in the health uh, insurance law opinion, because the court uh, in, in, in one of those obscenity cases essentially said, it is not for us to determine certain questions, this concerned actually the commerce power and a federal anti-obscenity law, um, but that's a judgment for the legislature. And Rand's response to that was, uh, no, that's absolutely wrong. That's an example of context dropping because it ignores uh, both the court's own role, critically important role in judicial review in enforcing the limits that the Constitution imposes, and it also ignores the overall context of the Constitution. The reason why certain powers like the Commerce Clause are enumerated is to limit those powers. And if the court is totally deferential to legislature, the court is not performing its job, 
And the court is not appreciating the full context of the Constitution. Uh, Jefferson happened to take that constitutional view, and that's part of the reason why I'll be using his presidency as an example of a modern presidency in the 19th century. As you'll see, he was very scrupulous in adhering to these written limits on the power of the office, the chains of the Constitution. Well, how did we get? the presidency, the office of president as is created under the Constitution. Uh, before there was a federal constitution, before there was even our first national constitution, the Articles of Federation, there were state constitutions drafted uh, starting in 1776, some of them even before the Declaration of Independence was adopted. Um, those earliest state constitutions generally did employ the principle of separation of powers. They had a separate executive who in most of the Constitution was called a governor. Um, but the governor in those early state constitutions generally was quite weak, was given very few powers. Uh, he was generally elected for a short term, often it was annually, by the legislature itself. So he was really a creature of the legislature. Uh, he did have the commander in chief power for the state militia or navy if the state had one. Very important in, in fighting the Revolutionary War. Um, but he lacked some important powers that we associate with the, with the executive today. Uh, the power to issue pardons, the power to uh, uh, veto legislation, and often the powers that he was given were shared with another organization, another entity uh, that uh, he had to act in conjunction with that was usually called a council, an executive council uh, that the governor had to uh, meet with. Now, New York in its 1970, uh, 1977, sorry, 1777 constitution was an exception. New York was the first state to have a governor elected by the people, not chosen by the legislature, for a fairly long term, a three-year term. Uh, the New York governor also had a veto power. It was limited, meaning it could be overridden by a two-thirds vote of the legislature, and he had to share it with an executive council, but he did have a veto. And in many respects, this uh, strong model of the executive that the New York governor had furnished a model, as we'll see, for the framers of the US Constitution for the office of president. States that adopted constitutions after New York in the, in the 1780s, Massachusetts in 1780, New Hampshire in 1784, also had a stronger executive than those earliest state constitutions. They gave the governor, for example, a limited veto that could be overridden by two-thirds vote, and it was not shared with the council. It was, could be exercised by the governor alone. Um, the Articles and Federation, our first national constitution before the US Constitution, had no separate executive branch at all. Uh, the government of the United States, the national government under the Articles and Federation, was literally the United States in Congress assembled. Its executive powers were uh, uh, exercised by a committee of the states, which met and functioned as the executive uh, when Congress was not in session. Now, that committee of the states did elect a chairman, and that person was called president. Uh, uh, and uh, that's why uh, I hate to uh, disagree with uh, David Kelly, but the simple example he gave yesterday, who was the first president of the United States? Some people might say, no, it wasn't George Washington. It was a man named John Hansen from Maryland because he was actually the first president, the first chairman of this committee of the states under their arms and federation. There were actually several of them before George Washington. The historical trivia, who were the presidents before George Washington? Um, but they weren't really an independent, they weren't an executive, they weren't independent, they were a committee of the legislature. And you can imagine the problems of having a committee functioning as chief executive, particularly in times of war. George Washington, who ended up presiding over the Constitutional Convention as commander in chief of the Continental Army, knew as well as anybody the problems of having, uh, uh, having a report to a committee. 
and decisions that need to be made, made swiftly and decisively being made by a committee instead of one individual. So not surprisingly, when the delegates at the Constitutional Convention assembled in Philadelphia in the spring of 1787, they generally supported the idea of an independent executive branch and a single executive. And uh, by some point in the convention, they coalesced around the idea of the title for that executive being president, president of the United States. But the delegates widely disagreed over the details. Um, and that's why the office of president of the United States, as it was created by the Constitution, really is a unique American invention. It's unlike any other executive office in Anglo-American constitutional history. That's because it's the result of various political compromises that were made by the delegates at the Constitutional Convention. Now, what are some of the leading features of the president, the leading powers of the president? This is where I pull out my handy pocket constitution to give a plug for the Cato Institute. This is the uh, pocket constitution that the Cato Institute uh, uh, has been distributing for years. Uh, tomorrow, in the second part of my talk, I'll make a plug for uh, the argument that if not every American, at least every politician, every political official ought to carry around a pocket constitution and consult it frequently. Uh, and that, of course, includes members of the Supreme Court. It would help if they consulted the actual document instead of just their own precedent sometimes in deciding cases. Um, anyway, <laughs> what are the chief powers? Well, as I said, Article II deals with the powers of the president, primarily the executive powers. The fundamental one, the most important power, is the very first one mentioned in Article 2, Section 1, the executive power vested in the president. What is the executive power? It's the power to execute, to enforce the laws. Um, the president's not only given the power to enforce the laws, he is given a duty, which is also imposed by Article 2. Article 2, Section 3, provides that the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. He's also required to take an oath, uh, declaring, swearing, uh, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So the president's job as chief executive is to enforce the laws that have been passed by the Congress. Uh, his role was nicely summed up by John Dickinson at the Constitutional Convention as merely ministerial. And what Dickinson meant was the president doesn't make policy decisions. He doesn't decide what the law should be. He takes the laws as passed by Congress and he enforces them. Whether he likes them or not, that's his job. Um, Congress, of course, is given the power to make laws. And that power includes a very important power, the power of the purse. And uh, that gives Congress the power not only to lay and collect taxes, and after this week's Supreme Court decision, I need to emphasize only certain kinds of taxes, not any whatever tax Congress wants to levy. The Constitution spells out exactly what kind of taxes Congress is limited to. Um, Thankfully, I don't have to get into, I don't want to turn this talk into a, into a lecture on tax law, so I'll stop there. Uh, but in addition to the power to levy and collect taxes, Congress has also given the power to appropriate money. That's really what we mean by the power of the purse. Article 1, Section 9 has a provision that says no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Uh, so the president really has very little discretion or should have very little discretion when it comes to the law and even the spending of money. Second, the president's legislative powers. Because of this principle of checks and balances that I talked about earlier, the president is given some legislative powers, powers that he shares with the Congress. Uh, they're spelled out in Article I appropriately because that spells out the legislative powers. Most important famous one is the veto. Now the veto was seen by almost everyone in early American history um, as a shield, that was the word that Hamilton used in the Federalist Papers, against unconstitutional 
legislation. Hamilton argued that it, should, it was particularly important to protect the office of the president and executive powers against depredations, in his words, by Congress. Now, since I have these four chairs up here, uh, I thought I would create an imaginary panel. Imagine that Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison are sitting in these chairs and we're having a discussion about the veto power. I already told you Hamilton's view, it's a shield against unconstitutional legislation. That was exactly what Mr. Jefferson would say if you ask him what was the power, or what was the veto power for. In his famous opinion on the bank bill, which he gave to George Washington saying that Hamilton's bill to establish the Bank of the United States, really sort of the forerunner to the modern Federal Reserve Bank, Jefferson was absolutely certain that it was unconstitutional because Congress has no power to create a bank. It's not within any of the enumerated powers given to Congress. But Jefferson, at the end of that opinion, uh, gave Washington some additional advice about the veto power. And he wrote that because the veto power is intended as a shield against unconstitutional legislation, only if the president were tolerably clear that the bill was unauthorized by the Constitution, should he veto it? Now, Hamilton wrote a very powerful opinion uh, uh, defending the constitutionality of the bill. Jefferson, indeed, may have undercut his whole argument there by giving this additional advice uh, about the veto power, and maybe perhaps that explains why Washington signed the bill into law, even though his cabinet was very divided over it, and Jefferson strenuously insisted, along with the Attorney General, that the bill was unconstitutional. But Jefferson's concern over the abuse of the veto power trumps his concern about the bank bill itself. So we have Jefferson and Hamilton, these two great antagonists in the constitutional questions of the 1790s, which I'll talk about very shortly, agreeing on something. So as I tell my students, if you can find Jefferson and, and, and Hamilton agreeing on any question of constitutional interpretation, you can be pretty damn sure that that reflects the consensus of all of the founders generation, both the major political parties of the 1790s. Now, the early presidents uh, exercised the veto quite sparingly. If we were to ask President Washington how many bills did you veto, he would say two. Uh, following the advice of Jefferson as Secretary of State, he vetoed two bills that he was clear were unconstitutional. Adams, who's not with us, but we can imagine him out in the audience, call on him, John, how many bills did you veto? None. Mr. Jefferson, how many bills did you veto while president? None. It was only Madison of the early presidents who exercised the veto in any considerable degree. He vetoed seven bills, all of them on constitutional grounds. So it's quite clear that the veto was intended to protect against unconstitutional legislation. Now there's one other important power that the president has with regard to legislation, but it's a very limited power. It's spelled out in Article II of the, of the Constitution, Article II, Section 2, the very first clause. The President shall from time to time give Congress information on the State of the Union and recommend legislation. Notice how limited that is. The President can recommend legislation, but the legislation itself ought to come at the initiative of Congress, not the President. His role solely is to recommend legislation. Um, Jefferson, as we'll see, interpreted that to mean an annual message to the President. It's a far cry from the modern State of the Union address, which I'll be talking about uh, tomorrow, which arguably goes well beyond what the Constitution gives the President in, in terms of the power to recommend legislation. Um, that power, incidentally enough, uh, or curiously enough, uh, was based on a very similar power uh, given the New York governor under the 1777 Constitution. So it's another example of how the New York governor, uh, the, the New York Constitution of 1777 really did provide a model for the framers of Article II of the U.S. Constitution. Other Article II powers that I should mention that are very important, Commander-in-Chief, not only of the Army and Navy of the United States, but of the militia of the several states when called into service of the United States. That gives the power to wage war, not to make 
war, in the sense of initiating war, because Congress alone is given through Article I of the Constitution, one of its enumerated powers in Article I, Section 8, the power to declare war. So the framers of the Constitution very carefully divided up the war powers, giving Congress the power to declare, to determine when wars should be fought. Why did they do that? Well, the people pay for wars through their tax money, through their own blood, so it's only appropriate that the representatives of the people should decide, the legislative branch, not the executive branch. Uh, Jefferson put it quite well in a letter to Madison in 1789. He said the framers of the Constitution sought to check the dog of war by taking it away from the executive and giving it to the legislature, uh, a change from the British Constitution. Um, President's not even given the power to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. Even though he's commander in chief, rules for the regulation of the military are legislative in nature, and so that power is given explicitly to Congress also in Article I, Section 8, as well as the power to organize, arm, discipline, and govern the militia. So the president's war power is quite limited uh, by the Constitution. He's given the appointment power, which is viewed as executive in nature, but this is where those examples of checks and balances from the other side come in. It's shared with the Senate. The Senate is given the power to advise and consent. A majority of the Senate must uh, approve presidential appointments. Why to do that? Again, to check against the abuse of power, particularly to prevent the appointment of uh, incompetent persons uh, to the executive. So for example, if you have an attorney general who breaks the law, uh, who defies <laughs> subpoena power, uh, someone uh, uh, like that who is uh, considered the nation's chief law enforcement official, obviously incompetent for his job. If the Senate had done its job, uh, when such a person was first up for confirmation appropriately, would have rejected him as not competent uh, to serve as uh, attorney general. Um, the treaty power to advise and consent, to, to approve or to ratify treaties, requires a supermajority, two-thirds of the Senate, before a treaty becomes fully effective. Another important check on the president's power. The president generally is given broad discretionary power in foreign affairs. Um, he is really the exclusive agent for the transaction of uh, business with foreign governments, um, but Treaties must be approved by two-thirds uh, of the Senate. Finally, the president is given a very broad power to grant pardons and reprieves for offenses against the United States, not limited in any way by the Constitution. George Mason, one of the leading anti-federalists, was quite concerned about how that might lead to abuses of power. Um, and perhaps George Mason's concerns were realized. We'll talk that, about that also in part two when we get to uh, Slick Willie's presidency and some of his 11th hour pardons. Uh, well, how did the early American presidents exercise these powers? Um, 1790s was a time of great political controversy. Our first political party system, permanent party system arose then, the Jeffersonian Republican Party, uh, the party headed by Jefferson and Madison in opposition to the Federalist Party, the government party, uh, during both terms of Washington's presidency and Adams' presidency. And there were many key political controversies during the so-called Federalist era, the, basically the decade of the 1790s, where the critical issues were constitutional, many of them reflecting fundamental disagreements about the scope of executive powers. There's one in particular that I want to emphasize, and that is during Washington's presidency, when he issued on his own authority as president uh, the Neutrality Proclamation in 1793. Uh, just a brief background, French minister to the United States stirring up, uh, attempting to stir up American public support for France in its war against Britain. The official policy of the United States was to be neutral in that war between France and Britain. Washington thought it advisable to remind Americans that the United States was neutral, because frankly there was this fear 
that uh, the French minister uh, Edmond Genet, Citizen Genet, uh, would so rouse Americans to support France that the United States might be dragged into that war. Britain could use that as a pretext for declaring war on us. So Washington wanted to remind Americans we were neutral. Hamilton, with his broad view of executive power, advised Washington, sure, you can do that. That's part of the executive power. And Washington issued the proclamation. Hamilton wrote some essays under the pseudonym Pacificus, man of peace, uh, published in the Federalist newspapers. Jefferson was alarmed. And he wrote to Madison, uh, you must respond to these heresies. Take up your pen. Uh, uh, now, why did Jefferson regard Hamilton's essays as heretical? Because Hamilton said that, of course, the president has the power to issue a neutrality proclamation because it's part of the executive power. A broad view of executive power. What did he cite in support of that? The British Constitution. Uh, Hamilton's Pacificus essays fulfilled Jefferson's greatest fear that Hamilton really was a monarchist, that he wanted uh, to impose on America the British monarchical system. Uh, when, when Jefferson found out, when he read Je uh, Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention, that at the Constitutional Convention, Hamilton himself had proposed a president for life and a Senate for life, his, his fears that Hamilton was a kind of closet monarchist uh, uh, were revealed. Uh, uh, but why was this such heresy? Well, remember what I said earlier, uh, that letter that Jefferson wrote Madison in 1789 to chain the dog of war. The framers of the Constitution gave the power to make war, to initiate it, to declare war to Congress alone. The fear that Jefferson and Madison had was by the president affirming the United States is neutral, that might bind Congress's hands, limit Congress's ability to, if it should decide to have the United States enter the war on the side of either Britain or France, to declare war. So out of respect for Congress's exclusive power to declare war, they thought it inappropriate for Washington to uh, issue this proclamation without at least consulting Congress. And that's what Madison argued in his essays in response to Hamilton uh, under the pseudonym Helvidius, that the war power is indeed shared and that the Congress alone exclusively has the power to initiate war. A declaration that the United States is neutral is in effect a declaration that we are not at war and are not going to war. That would bind uh, the hands of Congress unconstitutionally if the president were to do that on his own. That just shows how uh, how scrupulous uh, Jefferson and Madison were about uh, these chains of the Constitution that bound the presidency. Well, what about Jefferson as president? Critics in his own day and even today, some scholars argue that it, when in power, he was a hypocrite, he betrayed his principles. Well, those people didn't really study closely uh, Jefferson's own record as president, which is a record of extraordinary scrupulousness to the Constitution, and especially to the principle of separation of powers. I've argued in many contexts, including my book on Jefferson's constitutional thought, that more than any other president in US history, Jefferson took quite seriously this principle of separation of powers. Um, his view of his role as chief executive, as he wrote uh, about halfway through his presidency, was, he said, I am but a machine erected by the Constitution for the performance of certain acts according to the laws of action laid down for me. Um, he changed the practices of his predecessors, Washington and Adams, in many ways when he thought that they had stretched executive powers too far. For example, he refused to designate a day of national prayer, fasting, or thanksgiving. He noted that the First Amendment prohibits Congress from acts respecting religion, that prayer, fasting, and thanksgiving were religious exercises. And as, as an executive, chief executive, he, as president, was authorized only to execute those acts that Congress legitimately, constitutionally may enact. And the president cannot do indirectly what Congress is prohibited from doing directly by the Constitution. So no presidential proclamations for prayer, fasting, thanksgiving. Uh, as far as I know, the only other president who was that scrupulous was, Ale was Andrew Jackson. Even Madison, despite his, his agreement with Jefferson on matters involving religion, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, 
during the height of the War of 1812, Madison issued a presidential proclamation saying, those who might want to pray, if you're inclined to pray, uh, I suggest you do so on this particular day. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so he issued uh, uh, a proclamation, but was respectful, tolerant of, of, of people of different uh, religious faiths. But Jefferson, uh, and possibly Jackson alone, uh, issued no such presidential proclamation during his term. Uh, Jefferson sent the annual message, that report, on the State of the Union and recommendations for legislation by written message to Congress, usually in December each year of his presidency, rather than delivering it in person, as Washington and Adams had done. Why did he not deliver it in person? Because he said to have the president address a joint session of Congress, violate separation of powers, you have an executive officer addressing the legislature, also, Jefferson thought that looked too much like the British monarch opening sessions of parliament. And so it's one of these trappings of monarchy that he wanted the American presidency to be free of. So he dispensed with that practice of in-person messages, addresses to Congress, and instead sent a written message. Every president since Jefferson throughout the 19th century, even Lincoln at the height of the Civil War secession crisis, sent only written messages uh, to Congress until the early 20th century when that bastard Woodrow Wilson changed the practice uh, and created the modern State of the Union address. I'll address that too also in, in part two uh, tomorrow. Um, Jefferson also abolished the formal receptions, the levies that Washington and Adams held at the executive mansion. He held just informal dinner parties for members of Congress, usually only one party, so there'd be no partisan bickering over the dinner table. Again, downplaying the trappings, the pomp and circumstance of the office. Uh, more substantively, Jefferson did a number of things that showed his respect for the chains of the Constitution. When the war in the Mediterranean started, the Barbary War, uh, and these North African Muslim states, the uh, Islamic terrorists of two centuries ago started uh, attacking shipping, including American ships in the Mediterranean. Jefferson ordered the Navy to wage a defensive war only until Congress authorized offensive operations, again, out of this scrupulous regard for Congress's exclusive power to declare war. Hamilton thought that was absolutely nuts. Hamilton pointed out, as many people did, including some people in Jefferson's own cabinet, that the leader, the Sultan, the Bey, B-E-Y, as he was called, of Tripoli, had already declared war against the United States. So the, a, a state of war already existed. So it was unnecessary for Congress to declare war. We could just uh, respond. But Jefferson wanted to make sure that Congress authorized offensive action. So he very carefully drafted his first annual message in 1801 to describe the military situation in the Mediterranean. He talked about an American schooner that was attacked by Barbary uh, pirates that it could react defensively, protect itself, but it was limited in what it could do because Congress hadn't authorized offensive operations. That was actually, the, that little schooner was named the Enterprise, for those of you who might be Trekkers. So the very first U.S. Enterprise was involved in this Barbary War uh, under Jefferson. Congress did authorize it, first example of a war not formally declared by Congress, but Congress uh, passing resolution authorizing offensive operations uh, for it. Um, Jefferson, using his pardon power broadly, uh, exercised his prosecutorial discretion in stopping the enforcement of the Sedition Act, which he viewed unconstitutional, this act that, that made it a crime to criticize his predecessor, President Adams, uh, and the Congress, which by its own terms expired the day Jefferson became president, which shows what partisan part Federalist legislation it was. It was really designed to silence the Republican press. Uh, Jefferson wrote a famous letter to Abigail Adams explaining why he had done this. And uh, uh, this essentially ended his friendship with Abigail Adams, but he explained his theory that each branch of the national government should decide what the Constitution means. The president, in exercising his authority, should determine if, a law, if he believes the law is unconstitutional. Jefferson said the president could 
uh, refused to enforce that law. Or certainly he could exercise his explicit powers to uh, uh, issue pardons or discontinue prosecutions if he thought the law was unconstitutional. Finally, most, maybe most famously, Jefferson pushed for what, even under his own theory, was an unnecessary constitutional amendment authorizing the Louisiana Purchase because he was troubled. He, he took this principle of enumerated power so seriously because there was no power explicitly saying the United States could acquire new territory, even though his Treasury Secretary Gallatin said, well, it's clearly part of the treaty power. It's obviously you know, part of the power to enter into treaties. The, the Purchase of Louisiana was a treaty. Jefferson still thought it important, as he wrote one correspondent, to set an example against broad construction by explicitly amending the Constitution to authorize it. He actually drafted an amendment. He gave up on that when he was advised. Federalist, the minority in the Senate, might cause problems. Uh, Napoleon might change his mind, and we might lose the Louisiana Purchase if he pressed the, these constitutional scruples. So, extraordinarily scrupulous as president. Generally speaking, Jefferson's successors throughout the 19th century continued to respect these chains of the Constitution, as Jefferson called them. Uh, 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 Jackson, even though he wielded the powers broadly, he ve vetoed much legislation too, but on constitutional grounds, as Madison did. Um, Abraham Lincoln really stands out uh, as uh, the president who uh, uh, arguably uh, did violate the Constitution in, in, in exercising extraordinary powers to meet the extraordinary crisis the United States faced by the secession of 11 southern states, the so-called Confederate States of America, and his response resorted to extraordinary uses of presidential power to save the Union, as Lincoln thought, to preserve a Republican government. However, except for the draft uh, 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 didn't really set important precedents that Lincoln's successors followed. And interestingly enough, though Lincoln exercised these broad war powers, uh, you know, he, uh, maybe the most famous example is the, uh, uh, is the uh, um, Emancipation Proclamation, which he did explicitly under his power as commander-in-chief during time of actual war as a, as a war measure. Um, when it came to Congress and legislation and policy making, Lincoln was extraordinarily deferential to Congress. A paradox that's been explained by Civil War historian David Donald uh, in a little essay he wrote called A Wig in the White House. Because before he became a Republican, before the uh, Republican Party of the 19th century was created, uh, Lincoln was a member of the Whig Party, which got its name from it's criticism of Andrew Jackson's broad use of presidential power, calling him King Andrew. So the Whig in Lincoln had much respect for Congress and didn't want to interfere with Congress's prerogatives, even during the, during the Civil War. As I said, spent, when he called Congress in special session in July 4th, 1861, he didn't address them in person. He sent a written message. That brings me to my final point. Lincoln's successor, Andrew Jackson, the Democratic, uh, Andrew Johnson, sorry, the Democrat who became president when Lincoln was assassinated, first president to be impeached and nearly removed from office. I emphasize nearly. He came within one vote of being removed by the Senate. The Senate found him guilty by one vote shy of the two thirds required to remove him from office. Among the articles of impeachment, the grounds for removing Johnson from uh, office was that he was openly critical of Congress. He used his office as what Teddy Roosevelt will later call the bully pulpit, the president going around Congress, criticizing Congress, taking his case explicitly to the American people. So the tenth of the resolutions, of the articles, I'm sorry, of impeachment against Johnson said that Johnson had delivered public speeches throughout the United States in a loud voice, intemperate, inflammatory, and scandalous harangues, defaming Congress and the laws of the United States. He was criticized, he vetoed many important uh, Reconstruction Acts passed by Congress, including the first Federal Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, 
because Johnson actually was on fairly solid constitutional grounds in his veto, that's why the 14th Amendment became necessary to the Constitution to impose additional limits on the states. But he criticized Congress and its reconstruction policy generally. And for that, for giving speeches, he was impeached. Now, modern scholars have said, well, that just shows how political the impeachment of Johnson was. Walter Burns, a political scientist writing in the Wall Street Journal, in October, late October of 1994, at the time Bill Clinton was about to be impeached, wrote an interesting op-ed called The Prattling Presidency and suggested that what Johnson did in giving these public speeches openly criticizing Congress really was outside the bounds of the president as it was recognized in the 19th century. Most presidents officially only made a couple of speeches. Their inaugural address or addresses if they had two terms, extraordinary occasion. Lincoln he gave several speeches en route to Washington before he was inaugurated president. But once he became president, he gave only three official speeches, his two inaugural addresses and the famous five-minute dedication address at the cemetery, cemetery at Gettysburg. He gave a couple of his formal speeches from the balcony of the White House. But for a president in the 19th century to give public speeches, traveling around the country, campaigning for re-election, or criticizing, and particularly criticizing, Congress and the policy uh, followed by Congress and the laws passed by Congress, that was unthinkable grounds for removing a president from office in the 19th century. How far the office has come now that we're in the early years of the 21st century. In part two, I'll talk about how start, since the beginning of the 20th century, modern presidents have tried to burst these chains of the Constitution and perhaps have realized Jefferson's fears that the office has become an elective monarchy. I'll stop there so we have time for at least a few questions. Thanks. We do have time for just a few questions, and I will encourage you, if your question pertains to something more modern than was addressed today, to please hold it for the longer question period uh, that is planned for tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great talk. I'm looking forward to tomorrow as well. Um, two quick questions. I'm wondering if you can um, talk a little more about how the, the military draft came to be. Mm -hmm. And if you would um, talk about secession. I, I, I'm aware that there was mm -hmm. um, some discussion of secession as far back as um, um, uh, the late 1700s. Mm -hmm. um, that I believe I've, I heard that there was talk of secession in Massachusetts, for crying out loud. Yeah. And that yeah. this was not grounds for, you know, scandal and sending out the... Uh, the army. Yeah. Um, so how how did uh, secession come to be su such an issue that okay. Lincoln would you know get involved in the Civil War? Right. Well, the first part of your question is relatively easy. Uh, the draft really was not an act of executive power. It was a law passed by the Congress, the first uh, federal, the first United States Conscription Act, passed in 1863. Uh, interestingly enough, the Confederate states, the Confederate Constitution had a draft a year earlier. So that actually the first national conscription law in the United States was passed by the Confederate Congress, not the U.S. Congress. Um, Lincoln thought it was an appropriate exercise of Congress's powers to raise and support armies. He took a broad view of that power. He wrote a memo which was found in his papers but wasn't published at the time. Of course, it was quite controversial, led to those very violent uh, draft riots in New York City. But that did set the precedent, as I said, for the national draft that came later in World War I. Of course, the important difference between Lincoln, the draft in Lincoln's time in World War I, we added the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which by prohibiting involuntary servitude also should bar a military draft, because Lincoln himself recognized it was a form of involuntary servitude. Um, secession question is a huge one. I don't want to spend too much time. I, I gave a, a talk exclusively on that topic at the 2002 summer <laughs> seminar, sort of defending uh, Lincoln. As I briefly said in my talk today, he had an elaborate argument about the nature of the Union under the Constitution, an indissoluble Union of indissoluble states, as the Supreme Court later found, 
uh, in, in its uh, post, one of its post-Civil War uh, uh, amendments. Uh, bas uh, basically, Lincoln, you know, he denied that states had a right to secede. What his real concern, though, was, wasn't just this abstraction called the Union. He really believed that for a Republican government to survive, everybody must believe in the principle of majority will. So as long as the majority has reached a decision legitimately, the minority must acquiesce. And he thought the principle of secession threatened that, the very future of Republican government, which in the United States was supposed to be a model for the rest of the world. You're quite right in saying, the first serious attempt or threat to secede came from the New England states, from Federalists, who opposed the War of 1812 at the Hartford Convention in 1815. So when we think about secession, we think of the Southern secession crisis in 1860, 1861. But the New England Federalists actually first uh, uh, flirted with the idea. But it is a very controversial topic. There are a lot of uh, scholarly disagreements about it. My position essentially, constitutionally, is in, in agreement with Lincoln. I, I do not think there is a right to secede under the Constitution. Uh, whether there is a revolutionary right for people to throw off the form of government into which they had previously acquiesced, if they are subjected to a long train of abuses and usurpations, as Jefferson put in the Declaration, that's a separate question. Whether Southerners, they felt that that was the case, but whether that truly was the case in the years leading up to 1860-61, that's a great kind of thing we can argue about in the common room later on. <laughs> Could you comment briefly on the extent to which the presidency actually was rooted in some people's understanding of the role of the King of England or of the United Kingdom. Yeah, well, um, many of these powers that were given to the president um, were given him because they were thought as of, of executive powers and, and sort of the model of executive powers that Americans of the revolutionary generation had was that of, of the power of the king under the British Constitution or of the, or of the royal governors uh, uh, in colonial America. Um, but as I mentioned, the governors in these early state constitutions were very weak. Why was that? Because they were reacting against, arguably overreacting against, the perceived abuses of power by these British royal governors, colonial governors, who in some ways had even more power than the British king had. No British monarch since the Glorious Revolution dared veto an act of parliament. The veto power had essentially dropped away from the British monarch by the time of, the, well, by the 18th century. Um, but colonial governors vetoed legislation. That's why these early state constitutions, an overreaction against these abuses of power, uh, the, these tyrannical acts by British royal governors made their office weak. Uh, uh, the framers of the Constitution tried to learn from that, so they strengthened the executive office, but they really were fearful of resurrecting uh, uh, a, a monarchical power, either of the king or of these royal colonial governors, and that's why they put so many limitations. That's why they so carefully, and as I said, they so disagreed. You know, each of these provisions of Article II is a result of compromise. And they ironed it out because they agreed so profoundly on the details of how to best go about doing that. All right. Thank you th for a very good talk. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Hope thank to you. see everybody back here tomorrow morning. Thanks.